They sat at a table not far from mine. The diner was practically empty, not exactly a prime location for romantic dates, with its grease-slick floors and ever-present aroma of burnt bacon. And yet, they'd seated themselves at the table immediately to my left as if they needed an audience for their public displays of affection. I had already ordered, so I kept my face down and ate my breakfast bowl in peace. But every so often, I'd hear them loudly professing their love for another, and giggling, and making all manner of needlessly performative gestures. It bordered on perverse, so I eventually looked pointedly at them, with what I hoped was a silencing glare. I was just trying to eat my lunch in peace. The woman noticed my look, and in misinterpretation or in defiance of the intended effect, smiled at me. The man, seeing her attention elsewhere, turned, and he too smiled. Their flippant responses would have angered me, had I not noticed the oddness of their expressions. The smiles weren't impolite, not exactly, but there was something beneath them. An underlying impression or intimation of hostility. One that was far more potent than what I'd added to my glare. Just then my waitress came over with a pot of coffee. I extended my mug, happy to have the awkward interaction with the couple interrupted. When the waitress left, I saw that the couple had resumed their obnoxious snogging. Too tired to re-engage, just wanting to finish my meal and go home, I quickly ate my eggs and drained my mug. As I was walking past the couple to pay at the counter, I overheard the woman mention something about loners, and I was immediately sure that she was talking about me. I stopped in my tracks and glared at her, though this time she ignored me even though I was standing only a few feet away. The man then laughed, either in response to the woman's comment, or at my admittedly weird posturing. I wasn't exactly going to do anything, merely wanted them to know that I overheard. The waitress, perhaps seeing the interaction and wanting to avoid trouble, called over to me, asking if I was ready to pay. I nodded and turned away from the gossiping lovers. I paid, tipping a little more than usual for having nearly caused a scene, even though I felt that the couple were the ones ultimately responsible. Before I could step out the door, I heard someone call out, Hey, you! Turning, I saw that it had been the woman who was rising from the table. She came over to me and asked, We saw that you were alone. You don't have to be, not today. You're free to come with us if you like. We're just going around town enjoying the day. I was surprised. Not just by the offer, but by the woman's beauty, which I had apparently failed to notice in my agitation. It was almost discomforting, like staring into an exceptionally bright light. Her features were starkly refined and yet relaxed. Her eyes piercing as if she'd never once felt anything but total confidence in any given social situation. It was obvious that I couldn't refuse, so I meekly nodded, and as if sensing my response, he'd been facing the other way, the man rose from his seat and joined us. He paid for their meal, and the three of us left together. Luckily, I hadn't made any other plans for the day, otherwise I would have abandoned them without hesitation, regardless of whom they'd been. The three of us spent a few hours walking around town, exploring different shops, buying a few items here and there. I learned that they were visitors. They'd come from somewhere in old Europe, a phrase whose meaning I couldn't exactly discern, but accepted nonetheless. Aside from that, they said very little about themselves, and instead questioned me on my life, specifically why I was alone on Valentine's Day. Naturally, I felt embarrassed by the question, and offered the simple, though undoubtedly unconvincing, response that I'd never felt the need to find a date, just to celebrate the holiday. I was given the appropriate, that's fair, response, and the subject was promptly dropped. But the woman would occasionally point out random women and ask how I felt about them, if I found them beautiful, and the man would laugh. And there was nothing mocking about it. I sensed none of the smoldering animosity I'd seen in their gazes back at the diner. Things were still awkward, but no more so than you'd expect in such strange circumstances. Things took a turn for the worse when we entered a bookstore. There were understandably plenty of couples browsing the shelves and occupying the tables at the attached cafe. My companions quickly fell into form, grabbing cups of coffee and wandering through the aisles. 
Since I'd had a couple of cups back at the diner, I chose to forego more caffeine, and instead followed casually behind them whilst trying not to appear as some pathetic third wheel. It took a few moments for me to notice, but eventually, I realized we were slowly meandering through these sections, concerned with history, mythology, and ancient cultures, specifically those of European nature. I remembered then what they had said of their origins, and I tried to pay close attention to where their attentions lingered, so that I could figure out exactly where they'd come from. But before I could deduce anything definite, the man turned to me and said, You know, while this is all interesting and informative from a general's perspective, there really isn't anything here that'll tell you the full truth of it, of us, you know. I had no idea what he was talking about, so I replied, What do you mean? He smiled, and while the expression was outwardly friendly, I again perceived a subtler, darker meaning behind what now seemed like a superficial mask of friendliness. At that moment, my heart rate quickened a little, and as if overhearing it, the man looked down at my chest, and for the briefest second, the face beneath appeared, the once dormant malice flared to the surface. I wouldn't go far as to say it was demonic, but there was a certain inhumanity about it, and I instinctively backed away. The bookshelf behind me stopped my progress, and panic seized my limbs. The man's face relaxed, and his smile became no more threatening than that of a mischievous friend. You all right? There was no ironic or ulterior inflection to the question, but I nonetheless felt compelled to answer in the affirmative. Y yeah, I'm fine. I couldn't stop my heart from going haywire, but the man diverted his eyes from my chest to meet my gaze. He nodded and beckoned for me to follow him. We caught up to his partner, who had wandered over to the horror section. There, she had apparently found something of interest to her. She was engrossed in a book of old supernatural tales. The man went and stood behind her, placing his hands on her hips and peering over her shoulder. Every few moments, they would chuckle together. Curious, I ventured a little closer and peered at the open pages. I vaguely recognized a story of a tale about old blood drinkers. Not exactly vampires, but something similar, more feral. Having none of the pomp and aristocratic heritage commonly associated with the mythic horror. After a while, they closed the book and wandered off, and I followed, somehow knowing that they expected me to. They went toward an area of the bookstore that was under renovation, the section which had apparently held magazines and book-related trinkets. It was cordoned off by tape, the accompanying walls bare and repainted, the area was around a corner away from the main flow of foot traffic. As the couple rounded the corner, I felt an alarm go off in my head, a dim animal warning not to follow them. But another impulse, one that felt like it had been implanted, suppressed, the seemingly primal intrepidation. And I went around. I still can't figure out how they managed to transform so quickly. In the next five or six seconds it took me to join them, they turned into something else, something both less and more than human, older than mankind, yet somehow more evolved, more refined in savagery. They were alike in general appearance, though the woman had retained her female characteristics and the man his. Their bodies had broadened, becoming nearly as wide as the bookshelves we'd left behind. Their eyes had parted further, resting now at their temples, giving them a weird, fish-like appearance above their now pointed nose. Their skulls had expanded, ballooning to a size and shape that was nauseating in its unwholesomeness. The once blonde hair on both their heads had inexplicably grayed, now hanging in withered clumps from their irregular lumpy scalps, with beastly arced backs and hunched shoulders, they stood like proto-men, but their narrowed eyes' expressions bespoke of a callous intellect. Their clothes, taut in some places, loose in others, bore fresh bloodstains as if the transformation had caused their skin to burst or tear. They were awful, abominable things, and yet I couldn't even so much as turn away. I was awestruck, terror-stricken. I knew then that from the moment they'd laid eyes on me, I'd been under their monstrous thraldom. No one should be alone on this day, they spoke in unison, 
their voices that might have belonged to a reclusive crypt keeper, if not the dead he kept. The woman's mouth, which somehow had become utterly lipless, opened, and from out of it came a long, red-veined flesh tube, like an insect's proboscis. I watched, horrified, as it snaked its way through the air towards me. Unable to even move, I could do nothing but whimper sheepishly as the appendage touched my neck. Remembering the book they laughed at, I mustered the courage to beg them not to drink my blood, assuming that they were some horrid precursors of vampires. They laughed, the woman accomplishing this despite the long tube extending from her mouth, and the sound sent a stifling chill down my spine, silencing me. The man, with his ungodly face, smiled and said, Dear, could you imagine if we drank blood? We needed to subsist on that vile stuff. The woman, with her tubular tongue still dancing around my neck, replied, Oh, I just gave it all up. What a dreadful life that be. They let loose another round of that hoarse, ghoulish laughter, and my soul sank. No, I'm not going to drink your blood, child. I'm going to give you some of mine. Just then, there was a stabbing pain in my neck, and the tube went rigid right into the woman's mouth. There was a pulsing sensation, and I felt something being steadily pumped into me. I swooned as if suddenly and deeply intoxicated. Something foreign was coursing through my veins, paradoxically chilling and warming me. I, I at once felt feverish, drunk, physiologically unstable. Eventually, the proboscis was withdrawn. The woman slurped it back into her mouth like some vein-streaked noodle. My legs gave way, and I hit the floor just as their detransformation began. I was gently shaken awake by an employee of the bookstore. Their face was full of concern. I saw they dialed 911 on their phone, though hadn't called yet. Still a bit dazed, I looked around from the nightmarish couple, but saw only a small crowd of concerned customers. Wanting to believe it had all been some kind of fever daydream, I assured everyone that I was fine, and let the bookstore employee help me stand. I thanked him and hurriedly left, finally listening to that lizard-brained warning to get out of there. When I got home, I examined myself in the mirror. I didn't bother wiping away the subsequent tears. I had, after all, been stabbed or violently probed by something. There was a red puncture wound in my neck, rimmed with a weird purplish ring from which trailed s similarly colored streaks, like, like some kind of bacterial infection or toxin. It's been three hours since confirming the wound, and I've started hearing her voice in my head. She calls to me, across a distance that seems both vast and close, offering words of comfort and praise, sometimes sounding like a mother, other times like a lover. And a certain feeling of affection has blossomed in my heart, a longing for companionship whose nature feels disturbingly inhuman. I don't even know her name. They, they never told me. And I, for whatever reason, never bothered to ask. And yet, I'm starting to think that I love her. That, that I, I need her. And that she feels the same way about me. I've always felt alone and bitter on Valentine's Day. I, I don't feel that way anymore. Fall is finally here, and it's finally cooling down, which means it's time for you guys to get yourself a hot cup of tea. My wife happens to sell tea. Etsy.com slash shop slash ivory monocle tea sells different teas that are inspired by nerdy-based things, as well as a bunch of new teas that are available for the Halloween season. My personal favorite, and the one that I drink whenever I'm recording, is Dark and Stormy Night. It has a little Mr. Creepypasta symbol on it, and if you ask, you can get a little Mr. Creepypasta dabbing sticker. Also, anytime that you order one of those, you actually get my autograph on a little card, so if you want that, hey, you can get that. And finally, I want to give a huge thank you to everybody who supports me on Patreon. 
So I want to give a very special thank you to Jordan Humble, Diana Krause, Disciple, Strategy Wolf Emoji, Sully Man, Brandon Mendoza, Brimstone Pandemonium, Kaltuna, William Wellington, Scruffy the Janitor, Brenna Crow, Lakeda Canizales, Smiley the Psychotic, Jenna, Dante Kincaid, Simba's Bloody Mojo, Mephistopheles, Curse Pox Primark, M, Jesus Corneo, Yargul, Verbal Horror, Amber Clark, Jay Kearns, Mike, Himbo Jerry, Crusader Chocobo, Corbin Dallas, Estebean, Seclude, Salty Surprise, Red Shadow Cat, Turtle Man, Cryolinian, Mr. Marcus Blitz, Dirt Diver 030, Voice of Sand, Psychomel, Melted Lake, Tali Sue, William King, Sashi Sazaku, Croconut 509, Stricken, Freddy Krueger, Hades Nephew, Acid System, Sky Harbor, Nico Kyle, The Ginger Bros, Aaron Stormcrow, Daniel Polson, and Corey Kenshin. I really appreciate your support, and I cannot thank you enough. I wish you all the best. Sweet dreams.